Armstrong Month and uh, North American Mission Board Month where we give of our tithes and offerings during Christmas season. We give to Lottie Moon. During the Easter season, we have the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And the missions team uh, wanted to invite the Clements to come and share a little bit about their ministry so you can know some of the gifts that you give go directly to their ministry. And they have an awesome ministry right here in Oklahoma City, right? Really, a lot of what they do is just just east of us, right over here, meeting the needs of families, fe- feeding children and, and uh, young mothers. It's a really, really awesome ministry. And so we want the Clements to come up and share, and uh, we want to pray over them. We want to pray for their ministry, and it is our great honor to be a part of what you all do, a small part, but uh, we are blessed to be a part of that. Let me grab one of these microphones. Should be hot. This one back here. There it is. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I grabbed the wrong one. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, my name is Chad. I'm the pastor of Mission OKC, and my wife is the children's minister. And I appreciate y'all giving us just a couple of minutes to talk to you this morning. And uh, we are in our 12th year of ministry at Mission OKC, and we've had over 500 decisions for Christ in our first 12 years of church planting. Uh, we are, we have our hands full with kids and youth that are desperately in need. We have life skills classes going on for them. We're in the process of building a camp out by Chandler that's on 80 acres that's going to have 120 kids a week starting next summer, uh, that it's going to be free for them, and it's going to be a hugely evangelistic camp uh, that they get to participate in, and, and God has been so good to let us serve in that capacity. But what I really want to talk about is, um, is church planting and the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, because I'm really passionate about church planting. I'm on the church planting team for the Capital Association, and I just want to read you a quick verse. In Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, it says, But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word in my heart is like a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And the reason we've been preaching through Jeremiah all spring, we just finished up, but I wanted to share that verse with you because sometimes we hear from the kids that we serve, we'll hear a story of a way that they're hurting and things that are going on in their lives. And I hear that and I think, you know, how can these things be going on and the church doesn't know about it? But we serve a God who never sleeps. And he knows every single child, every single wife, every husband that is lost in in sin and hurting and in abuse or or in any way. He never sleeps. He knows about every single one of those situations going on. And when he looks out over our city and our state and our nation, his response to that is, one of his responses to that is church planting. The other is established churches. But in church planting, God can put a fire in the bones of a husband and wife. My wife has a fire in her bones to share God's word. And if we miss church because of snow or something, I know because she has to share God's word with me. And I have that same fire in my bones that I can't sleep at night thinking about the children and youth and families in our city that are hurting. And when God looks out and sees those things, he puts a fire in the bones of a church planter and sends them out specifically to reach people groups in areas that no one else is reaching. And, and he sends them there to do something incredibly hard and, and almost stupid if you think about it. It's, they, they go and they, they go into impossible situations with very uh, little funding, and, but they get the privilege of stepping out in faith and trusting God to go into these dark places and to see how God can can start to draw people to himself. We started in an apartment complex on 122nd and Penn making cookies and and giving fruit out to kids and and families right around us. And and we saw God start to bring in a harvest, and he has continued to do that. So when you support the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, God sees the people that need to be reached, and we collectively are helping in in obedience to him 
to go and reach those people groups, that we don't stay up at night thinking about all the lost people in our city, but God does. And, and church planners are doing a great job of going out and starting churches and Bible studies and in strange little places and storefronts and homes and in all kinds of ways. God is, is sending his people out. And in established churches like this, that fire in the bones could be, it's certainly from your preacher, but your Sunday school teachers, I know that there are those of you that have a fire in your bones to share God's word with, with children and youth and adults, and, and that God is using you to be that answer that he needs to increase his kingdom and to reach the lost. So I appreciate you all taking the time to, to let us share just a couple of quick words. Uh, about Mission OKC, and I would just encourage you uh, to participate in what God is doing through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Thank you. Amen. Give him a hand. Chad, Chad now, will you guys come stand down here? Let's come and pray over them real quick and, and take the, their ministry to the Lord. Again, it's an honor to be a part of Mission OKC, and uh, I know there are some other sister churches as well that, that help out and I think Chad and Anna would be the first to say they'd love to see our faces every now and then and, and being on the front lines. You know, last year when all the COVID stuff was going down, uh, they allowed us to come. Uh, many of our youth, Jeremiah, and many of the youth went and served with them. And it was one of the better things we got to do all, all year. And uh, it's just an awesome ministry. I mean, as, as you heard him say, 500 salvations. I mean, that makes me, in a positive way, I'm a little bit jealous of that. I want to see that happen here, but I'm, I praise the Lord that, that he is moving over their ministry and the Holy Spirit is just doing awesome things. So it's our privilege to join in them. Let's pray for them. Father God, we thank you so much for Chad and Anna, Lord, and we are grateful for each of them and their, their strong testimony and their witness to Jesus Christ. We pray for their family. We pray for their children. They have an awesome family, Lord, and, and uh, just wonderful uh, story of, of adoption and, and just, just really a cool story, Lord, and you're using them mightily. We pray, Lord, that you continue to do great works. And we pray here in the next several weeks, Lord, that you will continue to move in the power of the Holy Spirit and that many will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord, and press upon our hearts just the great need, the, the privilege, the honor it is to, to do ministry to them, to serve them and be with them and be shoulder to shoulder with them, Lord. And uh, I just, I'm grateful for their friendship. And I'm even more grateful for their, their work for the kingdom, Lord. So continue to bless them. And we are grateful to be a part of, the, uh, a small part of their ministry at Mission OKC. We pray this in the wonderful, sovereign name of King Jesus. All of God's people said. Let's give the Clements a hand one more time. Okay, as you're going back to your seats, take your Bibles and open up to... Genesis chapter 10, Genesis the 10th chapter. Uh, I know we've got some guests out there, and we are grateful that you're here with us today, guest. And uh, you might have noticed the little slip there in the pew in front of you. Take that slip, please, and fill that out. And you can just leave it in your seat or give it to one of our ushers on the way out. It's our privilege to get to know you. We're grateful that the Lord continues to bring uh, visitors and guests to Village Baptist OKC. And uh, we just love to study the Word. Uh, we love to, to do ministry with great ministries like Mission OKC. That's what we want to be about here. We want to see the Holy Spirit move and power. And if you're a guest and you're excited about that, then this would be a good fit for you because that's where the Lord is taking us here at Village Baptist OKC. So uh, Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. I was praying over the message before I... I came up and I remember something that C.S. Lewis said. He said, uh, every once in a while we need to take a break from defending the Word of God and we need to be filled with it. And that's what this time is. We need to be filled with the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've titled today's message. I believe it's a very relevant and important message. That's one of the things that we learn about the Old Testament narratives and the Old Testament teaching. So often we think, oh, that's so far back there, that, that old stodgy stuff that happened in history, and that's not important to me. And what I see over and over in the Old Testament in particular uh, is that there are, are great, uh, great examples of relevance for us in and through the Word. And so I've titled today's message, One Blood, One Race. I know 
you can turn on the TV and you can go to a sociology class and you can go to university and they can tell you that there are many races. Well, let me, let me be the first to tell you, I'm someone that I want to be dominated by the truth of Scripture. And the Scripture makes very clear that there is one race. I mean, that, that, that's just the truth. That's the fact of the matter of it. There is racism. There is people within the one human race that hurt each other, that look different than them, or are from a different economic status than them, or of a different people group. We certainly see that. Even people that look alike, and many of them talk alike. Look at, look at what's going on in, in Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine. Their, their languages, while different, are, are similar. They look similar, and yet they hate one another. And uh, so, so this is an age-old problem. And the Word of God gives us uh, prescription. He gives us remedy. He gives us healing regarding one blood and one race. And we've learned the last several weeks, uh, kind of delving into the first couple chapters of the book of Genesis, we've seen that the God that we serve, He is a God of discipline and wrath. But as we showed last week, along with His discipline and wrath, coupled right there, nestled right there in the wrath, is the very grace of God. The very gracious intentionality of God. And last week we learned that Yahweh remembers His remnant. He provides gracious sustaining along with His discipline and just wrath. And it is just wrath. He is a good God. He's a holy God. If we were systematic theologians this morning, when we had our chalkboard up here, we would say that we know that God is loving and that He is holy. Almost every Christian you ever talk to, they'll acknowledge that. And under the holiness of God, we might write the goodness of God. And under the goodness of God, we would write the justice of God. And under the justice of God, we would write the wrath of God. Wrath is just the doling out of God's justice. He is holy. He is good. And I don't know about y'all, but I want the Hitlers and the Putins of history, I want them to suffer a penalty for the things that they have done. A God that would not punish such evil men is not a God worth serving. That's not to say that such men can't be redeemed. I don't think that Mr. Putin is redeemed. That's my personal, unprofessional opinion, okay? But he can be. He can be redeemed. And that we do pray that he would repent of this uh, depravity and the death and the destruction that he has levied against innocent human beings. But we know that the God of Scripture, he is a just God. And along with his justice and his wrath is the fact that he always provides for the remnant there are a people that the Lord sets aside for Himself. He remembers His remnant. That's what we see more than anything in the story of Noah is that God remembers. He remembers His remnant. That's what it says in the text. And Yahweh remembered. Yahweh remembered Noah and his family. So God remembers His remnant. He re rewards with renewal. And last week, even though we often break the covenant with God in our sin... He chooses to ratify the covenant over and over with redemption. He is a God of loving grace and redemption. We also learned that in the end, uh, final analysis when it comes to serving Yahweh, the one true God, there's really only two choices. There's either, re either reference or rebellion. Either reference or rebellion. There is no in-between when it comes to a holy one of God. But we see that this truth of remnant runs throughout all of the biblical text, the, the, the title of the series is Vistas. We're seeing Jesus Christ in kind of the, the mountaintops. And as, uh, as people full of the Holy Spirit, and we have the full canon of God's Word, we do have the New Testament. There's nothing wrong. In fact, it's actually biblically coherent to take the New Testament and look back into the Old Testament as the Old Testament informs the New Testament so we can take the truth of the New Testament. We can see Christ crucified, Christ risen for all the world. We can see that in the Old Testament. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ, he didn't just show up there at the, the turn of the millennia a couple thousand years ago. He is on every page of Scripture, from Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. And that's what this series is all about. And so we learned about the importance of remnant last week. And the, the truth of remnant, as we learned it, it brings about the truth of hope amidst great devastation. 
A nation can be made aware of the involvement of God, the truth of God, the love of God. God is involved with his created order. That's one of the things that we've learned as we've gone from Genesis 1 and now here we are in Genesis 10 and 11. We have learned that, that God is involved with the created order. He is keenly involved, explicitly involved with my life and your life, with, with the apex of all of the created order, which is the human being who has been vested and endowed with the image of God. And so we learn about the importance of remnant and how God uh, uh, applies His grace and keeps, sets aside a people for His grace and His blessing. Well, today, we again, we look at this aspect of one race. Uh, great British ethicist G.E. Moore said this regarding humanity. He said, in the end, there is only one race, the human. In the end, there is only one race, the human. That is a true statement. That is something that we need to get in our minds in this overtly uh, racially charged day and age. We need to remember that there is one race. That is not to diminish the distinctions within the people of the one race. Do not misunderstand me. God has created all people beautiful. God has created all people in his own image. Each Difference in each diversity and distinction is of the Lord. And let me tell you something. You, this is good news for y'all. I know the men will get an amen out of this. When we get to heaven, all the people up there will not look like me, okay? And all the men said, amen. Good. All right, you're, you're tracking along. If you're expecting heaven to be filled with one type of person or one type of people, uh, you need to get clued in this morning. You need a Holy Spirit slap from His Word this morning. And that's what we're going to learn about. We're going to learn about one blood dovetailing into the one race. Now the good news is, even though the blood of humanity is tainted, all people in humanity are tainted, there has been and always will be one human being who did not have tainted blood. And he is your sovereign King, Jesus Christ. And it is his precious blood that can save us, that can, can infuse us and bless us. And the disease of sin can be overtaken by the precious, pristine, pure blood of Jesus Christ. All people from all tribes, nations, and tongues, God will save. And we'll see that in short order as we walk through the text today. With that in mind, let's look at Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1. As is our custom here, we stand in honor of the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. You'll see Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1. Now these are the records of the generations or the genealogies of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and the sons were born to them after the flood. What has just occurred? The flood has just occurred. All of humanity, with the exception of Noah and his family, has been wiped out. You say, why did that happen? Because the world had become so depraved, so sinful. The Bible tells us that God regretted having made us. But the good news is he didn't choose to annihilate the human race, although that is his sovereign divine right. He could choose to do so if he wanted to. He chose not to because he loves us and he wanted to see the human race proliferate and endure. And so let's read it again. This is kind of what, what is happening right after the flood. Now these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and the sons were born to them after the flood. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I pray that right now, I pray that you would remove me. I pray that it is the truth of your word. It is the power and the presence. It is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that will meet with us now. He is the teacher today. Remove me. Spotlight your text. May the power of the Holy Spirit be resonant in us as we seek to put on interpretive glasses and see what you have for us in your word. We don't want to just be knowledgeable about your word. Knowledge in the biblical sense is always experiential. We want to apply the word. And so here in a few moments, we're right now where the church gathered. Here in a few moments, we're going to be the church scattered. And we want to take your word into all the highways and byways of this city and beyond, Lord. And we want to take this truth that we learn about you and what you are telling us about ourselves and what you want us to do for your own glory. We want to take that with us, Lord. So 
apply your word to our hearts today and may it meet our hands and our feet as we walk out and go out into the city. Lord, be glorified in all that we say and do. I thank you for these sweet people, this spiritual family we call Village Baptist OKC. It is your church. We are here for your glory. And we pray that right now you would teach us by your spirit. In the great sovereign name of the sovereign monarch, Jesus Christ, all of God's people said, you may be seated. If you'd like to take some notes, you notice there on the inside flap of the bulletin for our guests, you want to take some notes. Rather difficult to fall asleep in one of my sermons. If you fall asleep, I will run down the aisle and I will <laughs> clap in your ear. But you shouldn't fall asleep because we're going to get right to the Word and you are excited to study the Word of God with me this morning. Here is your life point. Yahweh created one human race from one blood. God also saves the human race with one blood, His sons. Notice that. Yahweh created one human race from one blood. Every say, one race. Say, one blood. Let's do it again. One race. One blood. And from this one human race made with one human blood, there is another blood that can save, and it is the blood of Jesus Christ. We learn that there's one race. There's different nations that there are different tribes, there are different tongues. Again, this isn't a message about diminishing the distinctions. The distinctions and the way that God made us, they are beautiful. They are the way that God intended, okay? So we're not just trying to, to kind of wipe all of that away. What we're saying is we are one human race, and within the one human race, there are different nations. There are different tribes. There are different tongues. The Bible makes that very clear. And I want the Bible to inform my worldview, not some psychology or sociology class at the local university. We learned that Noah and his people, his family, they, have, they were at the top of Mount Ararat. And when the, the floodwaters were so tall, they literally encompassed the, uh, went over the top of the mountains, the tallest mountains. And they came to rest on Mount Ararat, which we know is basically essentially in the Middle East. It appears that they didn't travel that far. Remember, the ark is not a boat. It's not meant for sailing. It was only meant to stay on top of the water. That was its function. And it performed that to a T because Noah was obedient in following the instructions of Yahweh and constructing the ark, this big box, if you will. But now we know here in this Middle Eastern region, which we would call the Middle East today, there are uh, many, many people groups. This is the cradle, cradle of civiliz civilization, if you will. This is where all the peoples of the world, this is where they sprung from. All families of the earth descended from Noah. And we have in this text today, we have mention of individuals. We have mention of peoples. We have, individ uh, we have mention of cities. And we have these endless genealogies. I know some of y'all uh, struggle when you go to the book of Numbers or some of the chapters in Ezra and Nehemiah where these are very detailed genealogies. And I will remind you once again that I did read or I attempted to read every word when we went through Ezra and Nehemiah. I, tr I attempted to read all of those names to my shame. Now, if Bob Chisholm, my, my, uh, my Hebrew professor, was here, he would have been shaking his head the whole time as I was going through those names. I'm not going to do that this morning, so that is for your blessing, but we are going to hit and highlight some of these key verses in these two chapters. These genealogies, why are they important? There are ten passages in the book of Genesis that deal with genealogies or description of the gen generations of mankind. Why are these genealogies, why are they important? Well, number one, it demonstrates that the Lord is uh, involved in the details. He knows you and I personally. He knows our names. He knows the names of those that we consider ancient history. He knows them. He knows us. But also it speaks to the veracity of the biblical text. The Bible is the most historically accurate document in the world. And we also learned that names have meaning. Names have meaning. In your Bible studies, you should be looking up the meanings of names. They have meaning, just like 
My name has meaning. Your name has meaning. And we'll see that over and over that some of these people groups that are highlighted, the, the distinctions are, are mentioned, but they aren't primary. There's much more of a corporate sensation going on here that God sees us as one. He sees us as one people. He sees the human race as one people. Again, I know that may not be a very popular idea down there in the humanities class at the local university, but the truth of the matter is, I don't really care what they say. I want to know what the Lord says. I want to know what the Lord tells me about me and the human race. That's what matters to me is what God has said. And we're going to see three key ideas quickly kind of leap off the page regarding one blood and one race. First of all, one blood, one race, many nations. One blood, one race, many nations. Everybody say nations. There are many nations throughout the world. Look at verses 1 through 5. And again, we're not going to read all the way through Genesis uh, 10 and 11. But we're going to hit some key highlight verses here for the sake of time. Now these are the records of the generations of Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and the sons were born to them after the flood. Notice that. The sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tiras. And the sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz and Riphoth and Togarmah. And the sons of Javan were Elisha and Tarshish, Kittim, Dodonim. From these are, uh, notice this, the, the, the mention of nations here. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands. Everyone, according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. Star verse number five. From these, the crosslands of the nations were separated into their lands. Everyone according to his language, according to the families, into their nations. We see one blood, one race, but many nations. The mention of Javan, this is a, uh, an ancient word for the Greek people. It's very possible that Japheth, this is one of Noah's sons. Japheth, uh, Ham, and Shem are the sons of Noah. And from them, from the, the, the line and lineage of Noah, all of the world would be populated. Now you can even go back further than that. You can say that, that Noah, of course, is in the line and lineage of who the great progenitor, Adam, the great first Adam. But of course, that first Adam, he was sinful. We look forward to the second Adam. But we see here a mention of some different nations. The word for Javan is, a, is an ancient word for the Greek people. It's very possible that Japheth's people had migrated to Europe. Think in your mind, and next week maybe I'll put a map up on the screen, we just didn't have time this week, but next week we might put up on the screen, just think in your mind, the Mediterranean Sea, and just think about they're kind of in, in the, the cradle of civilization there in, in kind of Iraq and Iran in that area, and then moving back west to the Mediterranean Sea, and on the north side you have Asia Minor, on the lower side of the Mediterranean you have Egypt, that gives you kind of an idea there, and just think of just people just dispersing, just filling this area of the world. That's what's going on here. So we learn not only about Japheth's line, we also learn about the line of Ham in verses 6 through 20. I want you to look at verse 6. As you can start verse 2 regarding uh, Javan and the people of Europe and the other, other people groups that are mentioned there. I'm just I'm just doing this just by kind of way of illustration so you can see how, how, how the, the divvying up of the people came. Remember, it's one race. And yet within one race, they go. The, many people go to different areas. They go to different locales and geographies. They take on different, maybe different physical characteristics. Whatever it is, we see here in verse 6, we see the mention of the sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. Now... We, so, we know that from, from Ham, this uh, came the Cushites. And the Cushites, of course, are ancient Ethiopia. This is North Africa. And from Misraim, there is Egypt. That's from, the, from, from Misraim, the son of Ham. We see the, the people group of Egypt and the nation of Egypt begin to emerge. And then, of course, in this verse 15, we have mention of Canaanite. These are the people that would become the, the kind of the, the, the central uh, kernel or core of the Canaanite people. But an interesting thing about Ham, some of y'all may have done some 
reading in theology, and some have really butchered this uh, theologically regarding the quote-unquote the curse of Ham. There are people that have tried to condone slavery and try to try to argue that that God cursed a particular nation or people group within the one race and that condones slavery. Let me just tell you that right now that is junk theology. That is not in the Bible. That is man-made garbage. Do not ever ascribe to the quote unquote the curse of Ham. I'm not even going to belabor it much more. It's just not right. It is not accurate. Again, the Bible presents one human race. The beauty of the one human race, the apex of all of the created order, one human race. And within the one human race, there are many, many nations, many people. We also learn from the line of Shem. So we see the line of Japheth and then Ham and then Shem. These are the sons of Noah. In verses 21 through 31, we see the word or the name Eber or Eber. And this is Uh, ultimately derivative or would flow into the meaning of the word Hebrew. It's the same word that's applied to Abraham in uh, Genesis 14 and verse 13. And so that's another important nation. Let me submit to you, it probably comes as no shock, but the, the nation of Israel is a very important nation on the planet. All nations are important. All are important to God. And the Lord has a very special relationship. He has done special things through the nation of Israel, chiefly among them through, his, uh, through the line of Israel and the Israelites and from the people of Abraham would come the person that we know as Jesus Christ, the Savior of all the world. And that's why in, in Genesis chapter 12, when Yahweh is having a conversation with, with uh, Abram, he tells him that you're going to be father of many nations. And that through the line and lineage of Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. He's speaking, of course, of Jesus Christ. That Christ would be the blessing that the world needs. But you see here, the point of this is many, many nations. One blood, one human blood, the blood that flows in my my veins is is a human blood. The blood that flows in your veins is a human blood. And one race. And within that, many nations. Many, many nations. And in particular... Again, from the line of Shem, we learned that the Semitic people, the people that would speak Hebrew and Arabic uh, later on, this is, this is kind of how it all lines up. We don't have time to, to trace all of this out, but this is just kind of giving you the broad swath, if you will, the broad swipes and the paintbrush strokes. Along with one race and one blood stemming from one blood, we see the many nations. But we also also see one blood, one race, and many tribes. One blood, one race, many tribes. Everybody say tribes. Okay? Many nations, many tribes. Look at verse 32 of the text. And these are the families of the sons of Noah. So there's been this kind of uh, distillation of the generations of the sons of Noah, of Japheth and Ham and Shem. And verse 32, we see not only a mention of nations, but there, these are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies by their nations and out of these nations, notice this, were separated on the earth after the flood. Separation, okay? Uh, there's a lot of, if you follow uh, Southern Baptist Twitter, it's a dumpster fire, okay? And there's a lot of, quote unquote, tribalism going on in social media. People that are professed Christians that line up with one another and they attack other people that have a different perspective. And all I, all I can think every time is that the Lord is so not blessed and honored and glorified in any of that nonsense. The only tribe that I'm worried about here on earth, I'm, I'm an old Mississippi band Choctaw. I, I kind of like the Mississippi band Choctaws. But beyond that, there really is many, many tribes. Many nations and many, many tribes. Notice that they were separated on the earth after the flood. The nations were separated on the earth after the flood. And within the nations there are these other families and tribes that spring up. This list, of course, is not exhaustive as we If you read all the way through Genesis 10, it's not an exhaustive list of all the ancient people of all time. But the point is very clear that from the line and lineage of Noah, who came from Adam, one human race, all of the earth would spring up. All of the peoples of the earth would spring up. 
The divisions would, of course, come later as a result of other incidences. But we see that there are many tribes, but with the many tribes are just part of the many nations who are part of the one human race. I don't know about y'all, but I find that very, very encouraging that the Lord, the Lord likes, He likes the diversity. He, he is a, a master grand creator and He is an awesome painter and there's not just one color there on the canvas of humanity and there's just not one size of the, uh, on, the, uh, on the canvas of humanity. There are all different shapes and sizes and different skin tones and different backgrounds. It is all different but all subsumed under the one human race. You know what we've done is we've tried to tried to focus on all the distinctions. And we have taken the distinctions which are beautiful. And we have made those primary. They were never meant to be primary. The distinctions were meant to be celebrated because they are beautiful. But what we have said, oh, that person is different than me. They must be my enemy. Or that person's from a different area than me. That person, that person must be my enemy. Now, if you're a Longhorn fan in this morning, if you're a Longhorn fan, I, I'm praying for your salvation. We, I'm praying that we don't always have to be enemies. Maybe in heaven we won't. I don't know. It's a silly example, but so many of us are focused on the distinctions and the things that make us different. It's helpful to think that there's one God who has created one human race. Within that human race, there are many nations. Within those nations, there are tribes. But the truth of the matter is, again, when God sees you and I, He sees us as one human race. It is much more of a man-made centered, uh, man, kind of man-centered and man-made kind of view of anthropology that we would focus on all those distinctions and say, this is better than that, or this is not as good as that. That's a man-made thing. That's not of God. God sees you and I. He looks at us corporately. He sees us, the human race, as the human race. And we're really not as different as we think we are. Again, it's not to minimize the distinctions, but we are actually much more on the other side of the pendulum, on the other side of the spectrum. We're actually much better at over-maximizing the distinctions and creating divisions as a result of the distinctions. The Bible makes it very clear that we are truly one race. And we certainly, we can divvy it down into nations. We can divvy it down into tribes. Your next point is uh, tongues. That There's one blood, one race, and many tongues. But the fact of the matter is, within the one human race, there's really just two categories in the final analysis. Those who are in Christ and those who are not. Those who follow the one true God and those who do not. It is not based on skin tone. It's not based on socioeconomic status. It's certainly not based on academic credentials or the uh, diplomas you have on the wall or the money that you make. None of that matters in the grand economy of God. All that matters, all that's going to matter, the Father's going to ask you and I, did you know my son? Did you worship my son? In fact, Jesus himself is going to be the judge. That's what the Bible says. And if he doesn't know you, he's going to send you away. That's all that matters. The saved and the not saved. We are truly one race made up of many nations, made up of many tribes and many tongues. Let's quickly look to finish up here at uh, verses 1 through 9 of Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, that's Iraq, and they settled there. And they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. Verse 4, and they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower. Notice that. A city and a tower uh, whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And so the descendants of Noah... They're trying to get ahead of the game here. They know that God has destroyed the earth once again. And they're thinking about being dispersed. And they're trying to keep it all together. Verse 5. And Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. See the involvement of 
this God who is our creator. He's among his creatures and his created order. And Yahweh, verse 6, behold, Yahweh says, behold, they are one people and they will have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now, uh, now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come let us. And he's really speaking of the fact that they're probably much more on their way to wickedness once again. Verse 7, come, let us go down there, confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So Yahweh scattered them abroad, and there over the face of the whole earth they stopped building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth, and from Yahweh, from there Yahweh scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So you see the many, many tongues. This is the intentionality of God. Okay, this is a blessing of God. The people were growing more arrogant, more prideful. They wanted uh, the notoriety. We will be uh, such a great people that we could build a great tower to reach the heavens. How absurd is that? They didn't have a very good understanding that they can't get to heaven from here without the Lord's help. But they were motivated by their by the desire for notoriety and maybe even fame and power. And their pride and their arrogance would be their downfall. So God graciously, once again, He stymies and He foils their plans for their own good. The Bible tells us that Yahweh comes down to see. He is the all-knowing, sovereign God. He knows all things. He didn't have to physically come down to this earth, but He does. That's anthropomorphic language to, to, to let us know that, that God walks among us. I see that over and over. I think... A lot of the statements here in the Old Testament about God being among his people, you see all the other pagan gods, many of them were far off and distant. They weren't involved with the people. But the God of the Bible is. And we see that along with the many tribes and the many nations, there are many tongues. There is great beauty. There is great beauty in hearing other languages spoken especially in prayer, amen? Here in a couple of weeks, we're going to have, have uh, our service with Lavia, and they're going to come in here, and, and we're going to have uh, Pastor Ramon uh, pray a prayer. And I can tell you right now, I can listen to that man pray all day. Just his heart. And just the, just the kind of the lilt and the, the sound, the accents and the, just all of it, it's just a blessing to me. You see, there's blessing in the diversity. There's blessing in those who speak a different language. We don't all have to be alike, and what a boring world that would be. But we see here again that within the first 11 chapters of the Bible, there are three judgments that have been levied. First of all, expulsion from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. And then, of course, the flood. And here we see the scattering of the people over the earth. That was a form of judgment. But there in the judgment is, again, there in the wrath and the discipline is nestled the gracious, the gracious nature of God. That was to their benefit. And the Bible tells us that, they, that the city was known as, as Babel. It's a, it's a play on words or a, a pun from the, the Hebrew word Babel. And it literally means, the word Babel literally means to confuse. God confused their language. You see again the, the corporate nature here. God is seeing the people together. He sees them as one human race. Yes, there are many nations. There are many tribes. There are distinctions that should be celebrated. Not, not downgraded, but celebrated. But God sees us as one human race. And let me tell you something, the most important thing about this teaching is that from one blood there became one race and we are one race and we are all under condemnation. Every one of us. One blood, one race, all condemned. One blood, one, blood, all, one race, all of us are condemned. Quickly look there in the New Testament. Look at, at Romans 3. We're just going to do a, a quick walk through Romans to, to finish up today. You see... There's one who was born without a sin nature. His name is Jesus Christ. And he had pure, pristine blood. My blood, your blood. And, and I don't really understand. It's, certainly it's symbolic. It's metaphoric in that sense. But it also is very physical. Why do I know that bad blood is, is bad for you and I? Tainted blood, it causes death. It causes disease, which is all over the world. Okay? We just are coming out of this major 
pandemic of COVID and all of that. And we see the, we see the, 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 the traces and the consequences of sin. And it leaves all of us condemned. Romans 3 and verse 23. Many of you have memorized this verse. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now turn over to Romans 5 and go down to verse 12. We're talking about the corporate nature. No one righteous, no one is righteous. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And look at verse 12 of Romans 5. Therefore, just as through one man, speaking of the first Adam... Through one man centered, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. The, Adam is our federal head. We are found in him. You and I have a biological father. Guess what? As much as I love my daddy and as much as uh, integrity as he had, he was also a sinner just like you and I. And I got a sin nature from my dad just like you did. You got a sin nature. And all of us are condemned. And the wages of sin is death. Verse 23 of Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice the corporate nature of sin. One blood, one race. All of us are condemned. All of us have the same blood, no matter our distinctions, no matter our skin tones or where we're from or what we look like. But we all are under condemnation because of sin. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that many are saved. Many will be saved. Romans 8 and verse 1. Notice the corporate nature of this. Men, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to show that we're all together. I'm trying to show that as the human race, we're all together. Every one of us, the great equalizer, no matter what we look like or where we're from, is that we are sin, sinners. And the good news of Jesus Christ is that, that salvation can be found in one. It's not my works or your works or some other people, uh, people's works or anything else. It's only Jesus Christ and his work. Romans, 1, uh, Romans 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And hop along there to verse 14 of Romans 8. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Those who are saved are the ones that have the Holy Spirit in them. The Holy Spirit is resident in them. You are not saved if you don't have the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you don't need, you don't need a second blessing. The moment that you called on Jesus Christ, my brother in Christ, Jack LeBlanc, a couple weeks ago, when he knelt down with mom and daddy and he prayed and he asked Jesus Christ into his heart, guess what? At that moment, he received the Holy Spirit. Those who are being led of the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And then kind of rock it over here to Romans 10 to finish it all up. Look at the corporate nature. We're all under the condemnation of God. All of the human race, one blood, one human race, all of us condemned, but all can be saved if they will call on the name of Jesus Christ. Now, we know that the vast majority of the world will not be saved. Unfortunately, they reject the Lord Jesus Christ. But see the corporate nature here. Romans 10. Romans 10, verses 10 and 11. Actually, start in verse 9 and read through verse 13 with me to finish up. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. That's justification. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him, whoever believes in Christ will not be disappointed, for there is, notice this, no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all. Everybody say all. God is the God of all and all who are in Christ. He is the Lord of all who are in Christ. For the same Lord is Lord of all abounding in riches for all who call upon him. Again, the, really the, the, the great distinction is, the great division is those who are saved and those who are not. Those who are saved, those who are not. Where do you find yourself this morning? Verse 13. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, such a person will be saved. Regardless of what you look like or where you're from or whatever, whatever anything else we want to say, it does not matter. What matters is because of the sin nature, we are one human race and we have all received a sin nature because we all have biological sinful fathers. But there's one who can save us and it's the precious blood of Jesus 
Christ. What can save me from my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Stand with me and sing. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Father God, we are all sinners. We are one human race. And perhaps uh, this is a corrective that we need to to take to our own nation, to take to the world, to remind people that are, are trying to cause division that we are one human race and you love the human race. You loved us so much as the human race that you gave your own son, Jesus Christ. Yes, we have beautiful distinctions. We are many nations. We are many tribes. We have many different, different differences, if you will, Lord. We, there's diversity and beauty in the diversity. We speak different languages, but we are still one human race, and all of the human race is under the condemnation, is under wrath because, because we are sinners. But the good news is uh, one who does not have tainted blood like we do. Your son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross of Calvary, who remained sinless. He was born without sin. He lived a sinless life, and he went to the cross of Calvary from my sins and the sins of all the world. Every person in this room, every person in Oklahoma City, if they would just yet call on the name of the Lord, you tell us in your word, Father, that they will be saved. Father God, impress upon us that we are one human race, and there is one great disastrous problem, and that is sin. But the remedy for sin is the precious blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, may we take the gospel to the nations. May we take the gospel to all different tribes. May we take the gospel to all who speak different tongues and languages. Father God, use us to do your good and holy work for your own glory. In the great sovereign name of Jesus Christ, we pray all of God's people said. I'm going to ask you to remain standing right now during our time of invitation. You may have come in here today and you know what? You just say, you know what? I, I, I realize I have looked at people within the human race and I see them. I have taken their differences and I have twisted those differences and I've made them say something bad when they were never bad. And you just need to come forward and you need to repent of that. You know that in your heart. That's a, that's a conversation between you and the Lord. You can come forward. Perhaps you're in here today and you want to come and you want to join this fellowship. You know, the, the preacher's real crazy, but the music's great. And the people are wonderful. And we invite you, we invite you to come and extend the right hand of Christian fellowship to you. There's another group of people in here today, along with those who need to, to as Christians who need to repent. Maybe you just don't know Jesus Christ in a personal relationship. Maybe you realize that you have not been washed in the one true, precious, pristine, pure blood of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how you can do that. You can call on the name of Jesus Christ right now. Admit that you are a sinner. You have to acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you can't save yourself. You can't get to heaven yourself. You can't be like those, those people building the Tower of Babel trying to get to heaven. You can't get there. You won't ever get there. Nothing you do will ever get you there. And now you're going to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross is enough. And it is enough, okay? It is enough for you. And you're going to believe in Jesus Christ. What he did, he paid the penalty for your sin and my sin and the sin of all the worlds. And now you're going to confess Jesus as Lord as we learn in Romans 10. Uh, if that's what you want to do today, would you just obey the Holy Spirit? Whatever the Holy Spirit's telling you to do, just obey. You come forward as the Lord leads. Let's sing.